Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the last lecture of EC 2026, Introduction to Signal Processing, we looked at continuous time Fourier series and saw that we could represent a periodic signal as a possibly infinite sum of sinusoids whose frequencies are all integer multiples of some fundamental frequency. We saw that if you're lucky, you could use inverse Euler's formula and other tricks to rewrite your expression as a Fourier series directly. But sometimes, such as in the case of trying to analyze a square wave, you can't do that. So you have to resort to using the Fourier series analysis integral. Sometimes people like to represent a Fourier series in terms of separate cosine and sine terms, where the cosines and the sines have their own coefficients. In EC 2026, we generally stick with this complex sinusoid form. Now, if your signal x of t is real, then you can rewrite this sum using Euler's formula in terms of a sum of cosines with different amplitudes and phases. And then we have this dc term out in front, which is a naught. Now, when you're going from little ak to big ak, you need to remember to multiply by 2, but that doesn't apply to a naught. In the last lecture, we looked at this example where we have a signal that's a constant plus a couple of cosines. The fundamental frequency of this signal is 5 hertz. And in the particular spectrum we're going to draw down here, the horizontal axis is a hertz axis. Sometimes people use omega, so you need to pay attention. Anyway, it's easy enough to take these cosines, rewrite them using Euler's formula, and then you can just read off the Fourier series coefficients. You don't really have to do that much work. But if x of t is more complicated, this might not work. So, in such cases, you have to resort to the Fourier series integral. So, what you do is you take your function, you plug it in here. We're writing this as e to the minus j 2 pi over t naught k. Now, remember 1 over t naught is the same as f naught, so we could write this as 2 pi f naught kt. And sometimes when I'm working out a Fourier series, I'll write it like that. But at some point, I'll replace that f naught with 1 over t naught because you want that t naught to be able to cancel with other t naughts in the expressions as you work through the problem. Be careful to note that there's a plus sign in the exponent in the Fourier series itself, but there's a minus sign in the equivalent spot in the Fourier series integral. You also have to be sure to remember to divide by t naught. If you wind up with an answer and it has a t naught in front, you probably forgot that 1 over t naught. So the core of the operation is you take your function and you multiply it against this complex exponential, and then you integrate that over one period. Remember, x of t is periodic with period t naught, and this complex exponential is periodic with period t naught. So don't read too much into the fact that this particular example here is written in terms of an integral going from 0 to t naught. Any period will do. So minus t naught to 0 will work. Minus t naught over 2 to t naught over 2 will work. Generally, one of these choices of limits will be a lot more convenient to compute than another. What limits you want to use will often be determined by how x t is defined because it's usually defined over a particular range, and then it's implied that it's periodically replicated outside of that range. So you generally choose your limits based on what range x of t is defined over, but your mileage may vary. Notice that if we plug in x equals 0, this complex exponential is just 1. So a naught turns into just the average of the signal over one period. Sometimes we'll ask an exam question to make sure you understand this. We may give you a function and just ask for a naught. What you don't want to do is try to compute the general formula for a k and then plug in k equals zero. We're looking to see if you know you can use this simpler formula. Of course, you may be able to solve the problem by computing the a k for general k and then plugging in k equals zero, but that's going to eat up a ton of time on the exam. And if we give you a function like this, we're basically looking to see that you know that you don't have to use this formula. Now, you can take this x of t, plug it into this formula, 
and it will, after several pages of work, give you the correct answer, but that's going to be a whole lot more tedious than just writing things out directly. If your signal is real, then it wouldn't surprise you to learn that your Fourier series coefficients have conjugate symmetry. So let's talk about an example where you need that Fourier analysis integral. Let's talk about a square wave. This is one of the fundamental waveforms that you'll find in nearly any analog music synthesizer. This particular square wave is 1 between 0 and t0 over 2, and it's 0 for the rest of the wave. Don't get too wrapped up in the equal part of the less than or equal to, or the fact that this less than doesn't have an equal part to it. You'll see that the Fourier series doesn't depend on exactly what the function is at these transitions. And as a general word of warning, if you're working a problem and the answer to the problem does depend on exactly what the value of a function is at a discontinuity like this, you should view your results very skeptically. And actually, you should view your problem skeptically because it may not be well posed. Once we get these coefficients, you'll see that we can use a property at the end of the lecture to get the coefficients resulting from a square wave that shifted up or down, or that scaled, or that shifted left or right. We'll work this particular example for the special case of t0 equals 0.04, but you could basically replace all the 0.04s in the derivation with t0s to get a general derivation. So here's the general Fourier analysis integral. This k0 equals 0 is a bit of a spoiler. We'll see something strange happens for k equals 0 in this particular case. For some other functions, this will work for k equals 0 just fine. x is defined piecewise. In this particular case, the first part of the function is going between 0 and 0.02. That's t0 over 2, and it's 1 over that region. Now, I could technically write another integral associated with the t0 over 2 to t0 portion, but that's just 0, so we're not going to bother writing that. So when we perform the indefinite integral, this constant in front of the t winds up showing up in the denominator. And come to think of it, I think this section of the class on 4A series is the only part of the course where we use integral calculus. So if you're someone from the more general community who's watching these and you're not following these steps, don't worry about it. You can get some insight from the results and you'll be able to follow the rest of the course just fine. Now, if you're a student taking this course for credit, you better know how to do all of this. So to perform the definite integral, we need to plug in 0.02 for t, and when we do that, we get this e to the minus j pi k term. And then for the lower limit, we plug in 0 for t. That just gives us 1. Notice, e to the minus j pi is the same thing as minus 1. And I can take this minus sign here and distribute it through to write 1 minus minus 1 to the power of k. Now, this minus 1 to the k, this is going to be 1 for even k and minus 1 for odd k. So for even k, I'll get 1 minus 1, which is 0. For odd k, I'll get 1 minus minus 1, which is 2. So for odd k, that 2 in the numerator is going to cancel with the 2 in the denominator. But for even k, well, it zeroes out. But remember, everything I just talked about is for k not equal to 0. If we think about what happens at k equals 0, I have 0 over 0, which is an indeterminate form. It's easiest to treat this separately using this special case for the DC coefficient. If we plug in k equals 0, we see it's the integral of the function over one period divided by t naught. And remember, an integral is just an area. So if we think about this, we can actually work through the calculus, or we can just look at the function itself and easily figure out that this has an area of 0.02. So when we divide that 0.02 by 0.04, we get a half. And that's very intuitive. If you just look at the function, okay, it's at 1 half the time and 0 half the time. It makes sense that the DC value is a half. One word of warning, this area is a signed area. 
So bits of area of your curve that go below the horizontal axis subtract from the bits of area that are above the horizontal axis. Now, there is another way to get this one half. You can use L'Hopital's rule on this expression. If I take the derivative of the denominator, that will give me a minus j 2 pi. And then if I take the derivative of the numerator, I wind up with the e to the minus j pi k with a minus j pi in front. And then letting k go to zero in the numerator, this winds up turning into one. Letting k go to zero in the denominator, well, there's no k in there anyway. Let's see, the minus j cancel, the minus j's cancel, the pi's cancel, and I'm left with one half. Now that does feel a little weird because I said let k go to zero, treating k as a real number, even though you know k is supposed to be an integer, but don't worry about it. It works out okay. It's fine. Obviously, this approach of just computing the area is faster, but it's good to know that this formula is consistent with that result. So putting that all together, we see that the Fourier series coefficients are zero for even k, besides k equals zero. For k equals zero, we get one half. That's the DC value. And for odd k, it's one over j pi k. Let's plot the spectrum. So for a period of 0.04 seconds, that's a frequency of 25 hertz. And the spectrum looks like this. You can see the missing even harmonics here. And we see that the harmonics slope off in amplitude on the order of 1 over k. In the next lecture, we'll compute the Fourier series coefficients of a triangle wave. Those coefficients slope off on the order of 1 over k squared. So they slope off faster as a function of k. But the triangle wave is also missing those even harmonics. So all of the hard work is in the analysis to find the a sub k. And once you have the a sub k, it's easy enough to make the plot. So the Fourier series for a square wave is an infinite series. Let's see what happens if you try to reconstruct the signal using a finite number of terms. And when we do this, to make sure x of t stays real, we'll go from minus n to n. So these conjugate pairs can form real valued sinusoids. So our Fourier series analysis integral took our signal and sliced and diced it to be able to write it as a possibly infinite sum of sinusoids. And now we'll see what happens when we try to reconstruct the signal from a finite set of those sinusoids. If we just include the DC term and the first and third harmonics, we wind up with this sum of cosines. And really, the phases here are all minus pi over 2. So we could rewrite this using sine functions if we wanted. If we take a look at what that looks like, you'll see that you've got the basic structure of that square wave. But, of course, it's smoother than a square wave. And you'll see these two little horns here. The first harmonic gives us the fundamental period. Well, that's not surprising because it's the fundamental. And then the third harmonic gives us these horns. So let's now add in the fifth and seventh harmonics. Now, to get this to all fit on the slide, we are using the sine form here. And we can see that even with just four sinusoids, the square wave starts to take shape. Notice that the wiggles in the middle don't go as high as the wiggles on the edge. Here, going all the way up to the 17th harmonic, we see that even though the main part of the square wave flattens out, this little horn on the edge never quite goes away. That's referred to as Gibbs phenomenon or Gibbs overshoot. And you're always going to get that when you're trying to reconstruct a discontinuity with a finite number of sinusoids. So you can't really treat this equality as a pointwise equality for signals with discontinuities. And the question of what kind of convergence that equality implies requires a little bit more subtlety. But this is a technical point you don't really need to worry about in EC 2026. So this was a unipolar square wave that went from zero to one. What if we instead had a waveform that went from minus a half to a half? Well, that would correspond to just a DC shift. If I took this x of t and subtracted a half, that would give me this waveform. So that would correspond to me taking my original a naught of one half and subtracting a half from it to get a new a naught, 
which would just be zero. So adding a constant to a wave just corresponds to changing a naught. The other coefficients stay the same. Now, what if I want to shift the waveform? Maybe I want to set up the waveform so that the origin is in the middle of this section where x of t is 1. Well, you could redo this derivation, but we already went through all that work to get this. So you might want to use this cool property. If you already know the Fourier series coefficients for a certain waveform, there's a way to get the Fourier series coefficients from a shifted and scaled version of the waveform. Now, the scaling's not that interesting. It just hangs out in front. But let's look at what happens when you shift a waveform. So we take this t minus td and plug it in for t in the Fourier series. And then we can split this exponential up into two exponentials. I have one involving t that just pulls out over here. And then I have an exponential that includes all of the stuff times the minus td, which gives me this exponential here that doesn't have a t in it. It just has the shift td in it. So this expression here gives me my new Fourier series coefficients b sub k for my shifted and scaled waveform y of t. And this makes sense. If you shift your signal, all of the sinusoids making up your signal are going to change phase. The SP First toolbox on the DSP First website has this fun demo called F Series Demo, where you can select different kinds of waveforms, see what they look like reconstructed with different number of coefficients, look at the spectrum, etc., etc. And I'll include a link in the description below to Paul Falstad's Fourier web app. It defaults to a sine cosine representation, but you can click magnitude phase view to get it in a form we're used to looking at in this class. And you can try out different waveforms, etc., etc., etc. The main cool thing about this web app is you can actually listen to the result. Unfortunately, the sound seems to be glitching on my machine, so you should go to the website and try it out on your own.